Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I am of the stars. And I thought I'd mention a little bit more the philosophy that that punishment should be meted out because for because it's good for a person, especially a child, or that punishment um, is because they deserve it. Okay? Which Sometimes happens when parents are angry, they'll say something like that, you deserved it, and then, they, then the child gets corporeal punishment, what it's called. Or uh, the parent may come home upset from a day at work and, and uh, exercise corporeal punishment on the child and then say, it's for your own good, like that, right? This philosophy that punishment is good for us carries over from childhood learning and childhood trauma into actually there are even institutional instances of um, it's for your own good, right? And when this happens, when there's an institution that, that, that subscribes to this notion or these notions, uh, the result is uh, the pursuit of punishment as a, as a good thing in its own end, the pursuit of, of, of a suffering. This happens most prominently in spiritual institutions that feel that uh, selfless service is, uh, is, uh, is good for the soul. Now, in many instances, a spiritual institution could not survive without the notion of selfless service, meaning that people give of themselves in order to enjoy the benefits of the group, to help the group thrive and, and grow. But the problem is that this notion that suffering is good for us and that we deserve suffering and that it's for our own good also enters into the notion of selfless service. I remember years ago, I belonged to an ashram, right? Many, 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 many years ago, and they had a notion about selfless service. Uh, the problem was that, that it would get out of hand and that I'd find myself doing, spending every spare minute doing selfless service. And, and I would not be able to get done the things that I love to do as well, such as playing kirtan and so forth. Because all the time I was doing this selfless service, which was defined by the head of the ashram as certain things, which might or might not be things that I enjoy doing, you see. And as I've gotten older, I've come to an understanding about selfless service that, it's, that it will not help an institution unless it comes from the joy of the heart, you see. And, and so step, when I step over that boundary from 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 doing things for the joy of it, for the sake of the world, for the sake of humankind, into the territory of suffer because it's for your own good, I s suddenly reverse the whole energy of selfless service and suddenly nothing that I do serves the world and helps the world. It helps instead, instead of adding to the great positive energy of the world, it adds to the negative energies, the obverse side of the duality play. So how I'll go into the entities in the astral realm that are involved, I'm sure you know that story. <laughs> um, so, so may I suggest that that we purify and cleanse this notion of selfless service, which all the light workers wish to do, selfless service for humankind. Selfless service if you're involved in a group or a spiritual institution. Selfless service for that institution, but only if it doesn't hurt, only if we love every minute of it. We can choose. We have that power of choice. And when we don't choose, then we have an institution that takes away the power of free will of all of its people and detracts from their electromagnetic fields. So that, that kind of institution very, very readily turns to hypnosis, self-hypnosis for the sake of one person who is in charge of it. And so the power is stripped from the individual and all the individuals in the group and sent instead to one leader of the group who then prescribes selfless service that 
becomes suffering because of our lack of free will. So that's something definitely to be avoided. To the leader himself, it seems like a wonderful thing because he becomes very powerful, very macho, very top ego, top dog, right? It's the most terrific thing. But for everybody else in the group, it's pain and suffering and hell worlds and being used. <laughs> That's a terrible thought, isn't it? As the ascension proceeds, as the awakening uh, includes more and more people, more and more people would come to value these notions of the all and free will upon which our planet is based. And so the institutions of today will turn into the institutions of tomorrow that value uh, the all and free will, all beings everywhere. May they all be happy. May they all have enough to eat. May they all just live and exist in joy. May that be so for all beings everywhere. And may they all have free will. May they all act according to their free will. Right? More and more, these will be the hallmarks of the great human institutions of new life on new earth. I have just a little more to say about the type of selfless service. People come to spiritual counselors at big institutions and they say, Oh my, I'm guilty of so many things. I have, I, I have concerns about so many things in my life that I wish that I had done a different way and like that, you know. And, oh my gosh, I treated my children in this and such a way from time to time, and now they don't love me. And what can I do? I feel, I feel very bad. I feel worthless. I feel despondent. I'm in great despair and like that. I'm in great pain. My, my spirit sorrows. And then in the old days, uh, this used to happen near, near death in the medieval times, right? And there was one great Christian church then in Europe, and, and they had a setup for the wealthy there, uh, the churches, it was important to them to, to obtain more and more lands and to obtain more and more money and to grow the church, you know, the, the Christian church, the great Christian church of that, those eras. And um, so, so the rich would come. And this was an interesting prospect because of the goal of growing the church, right? It was, it, it, the rich should come at the end of their lives, having lived perhaps exactly as they wished to live, in a, in a state of uh, pursuit of pleasure all their lives, right? And, and no matter what the cost, that kind of thing. And then they would come at the end of their lives when they had their health was failing, and they would say, what shall I do? How can I save my soul, right? It's time to worry about that. And this is typical of, you know, life in the world, actually. But, but back then, they used to have a solution. They'd say that their clerics would pray for the soul of that person if a certain amount of alms would be donated to the church, right? And, this, this, and, the, and, the, and the, um, the wealthy would go right for it. Here was... Just as they were used to, somebody else to do their job for them, all that would be taken care of, and their souls would be saved, right? The, the practice of giving alms in exchange for, like, heavenly uh, removal of guilt and so forth. Then came a, a time when this practice was considered um, by, by many. There was just a popular sentiment which arose as the spirits of the people evolved and their souls, souls became more pure, came to an understanding that the giving of alms for the sake of receiving penance was a misuse of the power of the church for the sake of worldly gain, for the sake of worldly power. That, uh, and and there, was an, there was a change in the rules of the church that didn't allow that to happen anymore. It was like an upgrade in the understanding of everybody in the Christian church. Um, and it was a very big deal at the time, a very big deal to move from power-based feeling to up to the feeling of the heart and to let the heart rule and to stand in the notion that asking forgiveness of Christ would remove our sins, that that was what we had to do. Not give alms, but ask for forgiveness from Christ. And in that manner, to, to begin to walk with Christ and to feel 
the the Christ consciousness that that we're we're capable of as human beings to begin to receive that grace from God, right? And and so I mention this because the giving of alms is is another misconstruction of the notion of selfless service. I think that when people come to any institution, this is my feeling, when people come to any institution with a heavy heart and a notion that their sins must be absolved, that the thing to do is to explain to them that they need to seek forgiveness. All right, They need to, to give themselves a chance to be forgiven, to know that it's all right, to know that God's great grace waits for them, the grace of Christ if they're Christians, the grace of the Buddha if they're Buddhists, and so on. Okay, so, so what this does is it changes the heart energy from negative to positive. It changes the energy so that instead of working towards a goal, say, of, 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 of eventually being forgiven by doing a certain number of hours of work every day or by giving a certain amount of money, that instead they know that God's grace is everywhere and that forgiveness is instantaneous and that all they need to do is ask. I feel this very strongly, that, that it's a distortion of the light to, to ask for alms, in terms of work hours or money in exchange for forgiveness.